I'm Peter and I used to fly the Vulcan as you can see in the background. I joined the Air Force when I was 19 and went through uh, the standard flying training. At the end of my training uh, you had a choice of what aircraft you wanted to go on to and it was either going to be transport like Britannias and Comets or into the V-Force. Well I always wanted to be at the sharp end so I volunteered for Vulcans and luckily enough I got it. The initial design of the aircraft was a high-level nuclear strike and the idea was it could go above all the Soviet air defences. They got nothing they could get us with. That all changed in 1960 uh, when Gary Paz and his U-2 was shot down. He was at 75,000 feet. And in all fairness, they did fire 14 missiles at him before they got him. But it was a warning that high-level was no longer a viable option. So it was decided that if we couldn't go over the top, we'd go underneath. Sneaky. And so the profile changed. So we were no longer a high level profile. We're now going high level out to the edge of Soviet radar cover. We would descend below the radar cover and we'd go down. As long as we were below 300 feet, we'd be safe. Um, so uh, we would then proceed to target at low level. You have to go back to when the uh, V Force was conceived. And so you're going right the way back to 1947 and contracts went out for a high-level bomber capable of bombing from 50,000 feet, flying at 500 uh, miles an hour with a range of 2,000 miles. Chief designer was a chap called Roy Chadwick, and he was heavily influenced by a German designer called Alexander Lippitsch. Alexander Lippitsch proposed that for high-speed flight, the ideal aerodynamic shape was a delta, which influenced uh, Chadwick, and he came up with the design for the Vulcan. Sadly, he was killed in August 1947, so he didn't actually see the whole design through. But the result was what you see today. And I do like to point out that the Vulcan first flew in 1952, the 30th of August 1952, flown by Roly Falk. And if you go around the museum, you'll see a Lancaster. And the Lancaster first flew in 1942. There's only 11 years between the first flight of a Lancaster and the first flight of a Vulcan. And yet the technology had moved on amazingly. It was an amazing aeroplane to fly. It didn't fly quite the same as conventional aeroplanes uh, by virtue of the fact it was a Delta. Uh, it was very powerful. Uh, we had uh, The B2 had two, two types of engines. They would either have the 200 series Olympus, which produced 17,000 pounds of thrust each, or the 300 series, and that produced 18,000 pounds. So we had four of those. It was a very, very powerful aircraft. And from brakes off, to 45,000 feet, you could do it in less than 10 minutes. And that is quite something. When you think that the Lightning can do it in four, but the Lightning's a lot smaller. The Vulcan could do it in 10. Handling the Vulcan, as I say, you could throw it around the sky. She, it was, there was no problem doing it. She, she, you could throw around, really, any way you like. So she was very, and she was very easy to handle. What was the Vulcan good at? Well, it probably turn around and say, what was it bad at? And the answer was, it wasn't bad at anything. It was good at pretty well anything you wanted to do. It was excellent at high level. It was easy to handle. Roly Fultz, who was a test pilot, said it flew better than most contemporary fighters of his day. And to be perfectly honest, it flew better than most of the contemporary fighters of my day as well. Uh, it was great aircraft at low level. It had stacks of power. You could fly it up the side of a slag heap. You could just go straight up and straight over the top. I, once you understood some of the handlings as far as the approach and landing, which was not a problem, it was just a different technique, I can say that I can't think of anything it was, it was bad at. It was good at pretty well everything. It could do the job it was built for, and it could do the job it subsequently had to do. Well, the Vulcan originally was designed to carry Britain's first atomic bomb. It was called Blue Danube. It was a monstrous great thing. It was 24 feet long, 5 feet wide and weighed 10,000 pounds. Which is why the Vulcan has got a great big bomb bay. Obviously, as uh, atomic weapons were developed, we went through uh, a Red Beard, which is a bigger yield bomb. It was 15 to 25 kilotons. Then we went on to a rather unpleasant bomb called Violet Club. They only built five and it frightened the people who designed it, let alone anybody else. Uh, it then went on to a bomb called Yellow Sump, which was a lot smaller. We were then moving on to a 400 kiloton weapon. Uh, that was replaced by uh, Yellow Sun Mark II, which was a megaton weapon, first megaton weapon. At the same time, Avro developed a standoff missile called Blue Steel. 
and that had a range of about 150 miles. That went out of service about the time I uh, joined 617 Squadron and we by that time were carrying a weapon called the WE-177 Bravo and one shouldn't say this about a bomb but it was a very nice bomb shaped bomb it really did look bomb shaped um, and it weighed about a thousand pounds so we had a great big bomb bay and we only had a little bomb in it. If you watch aeroplanes landing on television aeroplanes land pretty well parallel to the runway they're like that, not a Vulcan. We didn't get any nose up pitch, so we came down with a very high nose attitude. We had a great big brake parachute, 45 foot ribbon parachute. Very effective at stopping the aeroplane. We didn't use it every time. The parachute section wouldn't really have been terribly happy having to repack 20 odd parachutes every day. But that meant, how did you stop the aeroplane normally? Now, if you look at a Vulcan, uh, all right, they're eight wheel bogies. But if you look at the wheels, they're about the same size as your car. Uh, so if you use your brakes purely to stop a Vulcan, you'd end up ending up with very hot brakes and you'd wear your brake pads out and the engineers probably would get upset about that. So we had to think of another way of stopping it. And the answer was when you landed, you already were coming in at a fairly high nose attitude, you'd actually raise the nose. You'd pull the nose up. First thing you did, you'd pull the stick back, get the nose as high as possible and you'd use aerodynamic braking. You'd hold that attitude until you got down to 80 knots then you'd lower the nose on the runway, you were now going slow enough, you could use the brakes and you could brake, turn off the runway. Uh, so that's what we did. Uh, it was a three month course. The first weeks were devoted to learning all about the aircraft systems. You then had to go off and do other courses. One of the things you had to learn to do was to pressure breathe. We operated up, we could operate up to 50,000 feet. Uh, and not enough up there, even though you were on oxygen, 100%. If you had a pressurization failure, well, it was not going to keep you alive. You had to have oxygen forced into your lungs. Uh, the other thing we had to do was we had to be rendered hypoxic. In other words, we had to see what happens when you don't have any oxygen. And for that, we used to go into a decompression chamber. And there'd be about six of you and an instructor, and you'd all have your masks on, you'd be plugged into oxygen, and they'd depressurize it to whatever height that we wanted to go to. And they'd come around and give you a clipboard and a pencil. And they'd say, fine, when I take your mask off, I want you to write something. I was told, write, Mary had a little lamb. So just keep writing, Mary had a little lamb. Okay, seemed a bit daft. So, okay, when I tapped on the shoulder, I took my mask off, and we were all busily writing on our clipboards. And then he sort of tapped me on the shoulder, put my mask back on, said, okay, you all okay? Yeah, look at your clipboards. So he looked at our clipboards, and there it was, Mary had a little lamb, Mary had a little lamb, Mary had a little squiggle, 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 squiggle and I had been rendered hypoxic, and you don't know it. And that was the whole purpose of the exercise. The other thing we had to do was we had to learn about the weapon. Luckily, the pilots, we didn't have to learn that much. All we had to do was to remember what color it was and the two-man principle. And I can remember to this day, in our days, the training we weapon was blue, Oxford blue, I have to say that. And the real one was white with a, a yellow band around the nose. And so we got that, we got patted on the head, you go and have a cup of coffee where the poor navigators had to sit there and answer lots of questions. Well, that's quite a good question. Um, if you cast your mind back to that period of history, in uh, the early 60s, we'd had the Cuba crisis, where the entire V-Force was brought up to 50 minutes readiness. So that was quite serious. And people really did think that the balloon was going to go up and we were going to end up going to war. And so there was always the possibility of something coming up that might push the Soviets into doing something silly. We didn't think, I never thought they really would do, but that was only my opinion. The Soviets knew where every one of our Vulcan bases were. They knew where every one of our dispersed bases were. And you could pretty well guarantee they would have an ICBM targeted on those airfields. So we had a four minute warning. We'd, we'd get off. Unfortunately, everybody at the base would check out. So the first aircraft, when the scramble was caught, he'd pull onto the runway, you'd start your clock. 10 seconds after he started moving, you'd start going, and so on and so forth. You'd get the whole lot airborne in about a minute. Uh, and then what would our role be? Uh, once airborne, we would head off on our pre-planned war route. But there was one hiccup. We could only go as far as 8 East. 8 East was our go-no-go -no -go line. You couldn't go beyond 8 East unless you got your release code words. Which I always thought was a bit of a problem because Basically, four minutes after we got airborne, 
bombs are going to start landing all over the countryside. And they would have aimed at uh, all our military installations, so who's going to send us a release code word? We were quite convinced that if we went, we would scramble as soon as we got airborne, they would give us a release code word. Otherwise, we'd all be stuck at the 80s going around in circles and all come home. There'd be nothing to come home to. And we were quite happy that uh, we would get to the target. We reckon we could make that. And from then on, we weren't so sure. But it did raise an interesting point. Every year, we used to go and drop £1,000 bombs. We used to get £3,000 bombs. And we used to go up to a range called Vestfru in Scotland. And we would drop them at a low level. And when they went off, the aeroplane rattled a bit. And I often thought, well, hang on a minute. I'm dropping a 450 kiloton weapon, 450,000 tons of TNT. A thousand pound bomb made me rattle. What's that going to do? It was a little time delay on it. And we were reliably informed by the scientists that we'd be far enough away to survive as long as we centralize the controls. We never found out, thank goodness. We're now inside uh, the aircraft, we're now in the crew compartment and in fact you're looking towards the back of the aircraft, the crew face backwards and starting off on the left hand side where the navigator radar sat, he was a bombardier and his main instrument was his uh, radar screen. In the middle is the plotter, he was in charge of the routine navigation of the aeroplane. Uh, his main instrument was the GPI Mark VI this is the big black box and the main information feed came from a Doppler radar. Where I'm sitting is where the uh, AO, the electronics officer, sat. He looked after the aircraft's electrics. This aircraft was a very electrical aircraft. Each engine drove a 40 kVA alternator. Uh, produced enough electricity to light up a small town. If you happen to look up, you'll see there's a theory pistol in the roof. And above me is a box of cartridges. When I was flying this aircraft, we still use the colours of the day, a hangover from the Second World War. And basically, if you were intercepted by a NATO aeroplane, <clears throat> you'd fire off the colours of the day and you'd say, oh, you're a friend and go away. I always thought if he didn't recognise a Vulcan, he was hardly likely to recognise the colours of the day. But there you go. To give you some idea of the sanitary arrangements in the Vulcan, that's provided <laughs> Uh, your P tube. When our crew arrived on 617, we hadn't been on the squadron very long when the boss invited us into the, well, John and I, into the office and said, uh, We've selected your crew to carry out a trial. And we were really rather pleased. You know, we were newbies on the squadron and already we've been selected specially to carry out a trial. So he disappeared behind his desk, rummaged in it, and he came out and plonked down a plastic envelope. And there was something red inside it. We looked and said, well, what's this? He said, it's a disposable P tube. We never ever used them. And we filled in a form and said, was it used? No, but it was very convenient. You put it in your pocket. And we ended up with quite a selection of these because he didn't want them back. Uh, but we did find it did have a use. If you actually took a pair of scissors and cut them open, there was a compressed silk sponge in it. And that was very handy for cleaning a car. Okay, we've now managed to squeeze into the cockpit and just to make ourselves really comfortable, we pull down the fuel panel. And a quick wander around the cockpit. First of all, the thing you will notice is the view out of the cockpit is not that great. It's often been described by flying an aeroplane looking out of a letterbox. Not the greatest view, but you did get used to it quite quickly. Uh, the engines were started either by a low pressure air trolley uh, to provide air to wind the engine up, or each engine had a compressed air bottle so we could do what was called a rapid start. So the usual procedure was you get one engine started, that's a combined HP cock and throttle, and you'd set that up to about uh, 75%, and then you could bleed the air from that engine and start each adjacent engine in turn, or if you wanted to start the other three all together, you'd set it up at about 93%, and then you could start the other three all at the same time. So you could get the aircraft going fairly quickly. When we were doing bombing runs, we'd select bomb on that, Here's the selected bomb on that, and the computer, this is analogue, once again, 50s technology. It used to do what I told you, it would take you to the target, it would open the bomb doors, release the bomb. The only thing it didn't do was close the bomb doors, but that was neither here nor there. For low flying, we had a radio altimeter. 
work from 5,000 feet uh, and below, very accurate within about two or three feet. So low flying, the selectors down on the port side, you select the height you wanted to fly at, and the demands came through on your flight system and you had some warning lights as well. We could also fly totally blind using terrain following radar, it's a little radar mounted on the nose. Um, and once again, the selectors down there and you could select what height you wanted to fly. And we used to practice, uh, not below a thousand feet, <laughs> Uh, not that we didn't believe it, but it was a very narrow beam and uh, uh, why, why muck about when you didn't have to? But it, it did work. At the top, you've got your Mach meter at high level. We didn't fly on indicated airspeed. Uh, we flew on our relative Mach number, which is the aircraft speed relative to the local speed of sound. There's a Vulcan cruise that marked decimal 86, which is quite fast. Um, when we did high speed runs, uh, we could go up to Mark Decimal 94 on the 200 series and 0.93 on the 300. <coughs> Never quite worked out why there was a 0.01 discrepancy between the two. Probably the most unusual uh, and worrying that happened to us, it was a lovely late summer day, little fluffy clouds, unlimited visibility. And we were out having a good day. And the next thing was, there was the most almighty bang and a flash. And John and I both looked in at the engine, we scanned the engine instruments, they were all working perfectly. Uh, we looked at all the other systems, we couldn't work out what it was. So as the flash had appeared in the crew compartment, we turned around and looked down the back. And there was our rear crew, they'd all swivel their seats and they were all ready to bail out of the aeroplane. Now I say, okay guys, we're still flying, we're okay, we're going home. So I put out what's called a pan call and we just joined the uh, radar pattern at Scampton and went and landed. And when we landed, in those days, the crew chiefs had their own aeroplanes and their own dispersal. So we taxied back to our dispersal and the chief said, you're back a bit early. And we said, well, we had this great big bang. And then we thought we'd better come back. Anyway, we put the aircraft to bed, shut it down, we all got out. I wish the chief had wandered around. He said, come and have a look at this. And just below the refueling probe, there's a big scorch mark. He said, you've been struck by lightning. He said, come have a look underneath. And there were all the discharge holes all the way along the fuselage, as far as the ECM bay. He said, that's ridiculous. There was no thunderstorm activity. It was a lovely summer day. I said, never heard of a bolt from the blue. And I said, in my entire flying career, which covers 50 years, uh, I've been struck by lightning many, many times, but never a bolt from the blue, which I'm pleased to say. But that was about the most exciting thing that did happen. I could see the role changing. Uh, the fun bit of flying the Vulcan was all the low level work. High level, you were basically driver's airframe, the back end ran the show, we ran the show in the low level. I always wanted to go on to Nimrod's Maritime, and so I kicked and screamed, and eventually they said, yeah, okay, Mary, if we'll go on to Nimrod's. Uh, and I spent the next 19 years flying those. And then I left the Air Force in 94, became a commercial pilot, uh, flying Airbus. And I did that until I retired. 50 years ago since I last flew a Vulcan. Um, and now I'm back engaged with the uh, museum with it. It brings it all back. And it's, instead of being 50 years ago, it just sometimes seems like it was only yesterday. As I say, I look back at my time with the Vulcan as really a very enjoyable period of my life. And here at Duxford, uh, you do have the opportunity to book a tour and you can get inside the Vulcan. And I or one of the other guides will show you around tell you all about the aircraft, its origins, uh, what it did, and really is quite interesting. You'll probably enjoy it.